this weekend is 34 years since Jesus came into my life. First, second and third. On the 2nd of June, 34 years ago, John and Maureen came into a hospital. John and Maureen are um, Sarah and Liz's parents. And they said to me, come and live with us. Because I didn't have any hope. 34 years, you know, of God being faithful, being true. He is good. Yes. You can know, I, I am an example of that. He is so faithful. And therefore, I get emotional. I think one of the reasons that the Lord brought me to Britain is to embarrass British people. <laughs> I love you. So, um, as I was praying, I felt the Lord gave me, giving me three sentences. Um, I felt for people here, and um, I felt, first of all, was a bit too general, but was general for me. It might be quite specific for you. The first sentence, sentence was, the birds that sing for you is the gift of God. The second sentence was, and it's funny because at that time I didn't, I wasn't connecting this weekend what happened to me 34 years ago, where I had, I had no hope. I just wanted to die. I had tried to commit suicide here in Frinton. And I, I didn't connect the two things. It's only this weekend talking to Sarah and Mark uh, one day that um, I thought, well, God has got a sense of humor. So this is the word. The Lord has not made you for death, but for life. Therefore, you will not die, but live and declare what the Lord has done. And perhaps God sent me here today to let you know that in the same way that he did what he did for me, he will do for you as well. And then finally, this last sentence. Jesus said, he is the door. There is no other door for salvation, for peace, for joy, for heaven. But the door is a low door. We have to bow our heads low in repentance if we are to enter by it. If any of these words rung in your heart, if you feel this is God speaking to me after the service, go to that banner there. Is that it? And people will pray for you. It's lovely seeing people here that such a long time since I haven't seen. Right, let us turn to John 13. That's what Mark asked me to speak on. I believe you have been going through John, haven't you? So uh, the word of God is wonderful. The word of God is the rock that stabilizes us at such an unstable time. Um, and I would like to um, look at John 13, perhaps in a slightly different way today. John 13 is about betrayal by the enemy, servanthood, denial by friends. But I would like us to look at it slightly different today in the sense that I want to picture three groups of people. The first one is Jesus and the Father. The second one is Judas and the devil. And the third one is Peter and the disciples. Okay, I don't know if we are going to be able to go through all this, but just picture that to begin with. So, 
John 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus is the perfect image of the Father. Jesus only does what the Father does. He only says what the Father says. He is perfect and altogether lovely. He is perfect and altogether lovely, just like his Father is. Verse 2, and during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Judas was doing exactly what his father was doing. You know, in a few chapters before, chapter 8, there was a time when Jesus was having a bit of a heated discussion, as he had often, with the Pharisees. And then he goes on to talk to people who actually had come to believe in him. I had never noticed that before in Scripture. But those people had come to believe in him. However, they were challenging who Jesus was. And they would say, who are you anyway? And he would say, I told you who I am. And then he, Jesus, started challenging those who had believed in him. He started challenging them about who they were, and they didn't like that. They said, we are children of Abraham. Come on, I'm a Christian. I know who I am well. The Lord knocked them off their horses pretty quick. That's the thing with Jesus, you know, as you are going to three, see through this chapter. Jesus, sometimes I am reading the Gospels, you know, and I think, Lord, why did you have to say that? Why did you have to be so challenging? But he does. And you know, it's so interesting because I wrote here, Jesus offends our sensibilities. He does offend my sensibilities a lot. I think he probably does yours as well. He offends our culture and he offends our pride. I think it's his speciality actually. Do you remember he said something like, do you think I came to bring peace? I came to bring a sword. This is the bit. I like the bit that when Jesus says, I am the prince of peace, because he did come to bring peace. But I don't like the bit that where he says, I came to challenge you. I came to make your life a bit different from what perhaps you expected it would be. For me, it worked really well. I have to tell you. But it's not always easy, is it? So... So Jesus says to these people, you are of the devil, your father. What a word, you know? You are of the devil, your father. Now, scripture tells us here that Judas Iscariot, that the devil had already put into Judas' heart to betray Jesus. When was that? just a few days before. And for you who were here, uh, when they taught, whoever taught on John 12, you remember that was a very special occasion that really impacted Jesus and the disciples. It was very, very impactful because it completely was out of their comfort zone was completely out of their culture, their norm. And that was a problem. Jesus really liked it. 
the disciples really didn't like it. And Judas was the one who spoke up. And Judas said this in John 12, chapter 4. Uh, I'll just put the, if you in the picture. You'd remember that a woman had, called Mary had come into a room, had broken an alabaster jar. Oh, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> broken the alabaster jar. It was very much like that, but was sealed, you see. And that is something that people would have had, women would have had, to give to their husbands as a dowry, you know? So that was very, very, very precious, very precious. And that would have been about, according to Judas, and he was very good with money. He knew how much things cost. About 300 denarii, which would be a year's wage, Today, we are talking about over 20,000 pounds. Can you imagine? Uh, 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 I don't know what's the most expensive perfume in the world, but, you know, I, I agreed with Judas most of my life, actually. <laughs> Let us read it. So, verse 4, he says, Judas uh, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 21,000 pounds and given to the poor? And then scripture reveals something very interesting. It says, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. There is another thief, a very well-known thief in scripture. Jesus calls him the devil. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. Anytime you see your life being destroyed, any time you see someone being killed or stolen from, you know where that's coming from. And he continues that uh, Judas had the money box. He was the treasurer for Jesus. Jesus, by the way, would have put him in that position. And he used to take what was put in it. In Matthew 26, Matthew gives a different version. Afterwards, you go and read. It's ever so interesting. Matthew doesn't give as many details as John does, but he gives some extra details. Because when she breaks that jar, she pours that jar to begin with over Jesus' head. And for a woman to do something like that, and we see that goes further and further, was a no-no. So that really upset Judas and the disciples, and they all agreed, no, you shouldn't have done that. But Jesus, he liked it. Jesus was pleased with her actions, and he said so. Not only that, he said, and because it's for my burial. So Judas said, that's it. That was at the point, Matthew reveals to us, that Judas goes and betrays Jesus. For him, that's enough. He's following his father's direction. Let's carry on. Three, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wa wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This was a, another shock. You know, I think walking with Jesus was one shock after another shock. You just don't do this. You see, one, one of the commentaries that I read, the Cambridge commentary says, it was the custom for his slaves to wash the feet of the guests before sitting down to eat. A master, a teacher, a rabbi should never do that. None is a no-no. You know, it's like if a King Charles 
would come, you know, they would have all the cameras outside and you come into your house and you are having like a cup of tea because he's doing some promotional stuff for, for his charitable work. And then he said, have you got a towel and a, a bowl of water, please? And then he would kneel down and start washing her feet. I mean, you'd be shocked. The cameras would be taking millions of pictures, wouldn't they? Well, that was kind of that for them. It's just not done. But, you know, I was actu uh, whilst I was thinking of this, um, as I was sitting in the lovely sunshine of Walton, I, I had a picture of Jesus taking that bowl and kneeling down at, you know, at the feet of his disciples and they thinking, what are you doing again? And then I, I imagine him thinking of someone else. Him thinking of a woman who broke the alabaster jar and she broke something really precious. He's, she started at the head, but she didn't stop there. Do you know what she did? She poured it on his feet and then she did something that was unheard of. She washed his feet with her own long hair. That was costly. And I wonder if Jesus saw, gosh, that was from the Father. That was true worship. A lot of people, most people around, condemned her. But I don't condemn her. She was doing what the Father wanted to do. And you know, I am going to follow that because I believe that was the Father doing that. I am going to wash your feet. I'm going to use water because I don't have a precious oil that costs 21,000 pounds. But I am going to later on shed something much more precious than anything you could ever imagine. And she, I believe as, as he washed their feet, he was thinking of her and the father was thinking of him and the blood would flow and wash away the sin of the whole world. Then he came to Peter, verse six, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you know this after. But you know after this. I want to say something to you today. On the 2nd of June of 2024, I want to say that to you. If you haven't heard it before in a Christian life, you are going to hear it today and you are going to hear it a lot. Especially those of you who are going to give your life to the Lord today. Jesus is going to say this to you. What I'm doing, you do not understand now. It's again and again and again. In my Christian life, Jesus says that to me. What I'm doing, you do not understand now. <laughs> I have had that <laughs> dozens of times. I said, I really don't, Lord. What I'm doing, you do not understand now. But you will later on. Don't worry. You will later on. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. You know what's speaking? Pride. Pride speaking. You shall never wash my feet. One of the commentaries said that for them it was something, Cal Calvin actually, don't like Calvin very much, I'm sorry, but he was good in some things. Foolish and unsuitable. Foolish and unsuitable. That's what Peter was thinking. This is foolish and unsuitable. How can Jesus, you master, you teacher, you rabbi, you whom I believe is the Christ, the son of God, I proclaimed you to be the Christ. How can you wash my feet? No. If Jesus doesn't wash us, do you know what he says? Let's look. If I do not wash you, 
you have no part with me. <clears throat> Pardon me. If Jesus doesn't wash us, he has no part with us. It's in his terms. The price was a great, great price. The perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who shed his blood on the cross, a place of torture. He was willing to go to a place of torture for us. But our pride says, no, I can do Jesus. I can jump high enough. I can be good enough. I can do enough. And he says, if you could, I wouldn't have come and died for you. I came and died for you because you could never satisfy. Another commentary, the Cambridge commentary said this, we are all filthy and abominable in the sight of God until Christ washes our stain. It's only when Jesus washes us that we are clean. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I could never reach the perfection that God expects. I could never. So he made the way. He gave the most precious thing he could ever give. And that's such a great sacrifice. Then Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You know, we are bathed in the blood of Christ Jesus and we are bathed in the words of God. It says it's the water, it's the washing of the water of the word. As we walk through this world, we constantly need to be bathed. That's when our feet is washed because we walk, walk through this world and our feet get dirty. You know, we just need to go out in the streets and it gets dirty. You turn the TV on, you turn the news on, it gets dirty. You, anything, any entertainment, you get, gets dirty. You read anything, it gets dirty. And it's the word of God that cleanses our feet on a daily basis. I would, let's just go to the last verses and then I'll stop. Jesus said in verse 12, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Jesus is saying, because what? Because of what I have done to you, now you know you what? You owe. That, that, that's, that word in the Greek means to owe. You owe to do that to others too. This is part of what following me means. And doesn't always feel great. It doesn't, does it? But it's what our master expects. But there is something else. It says in verse 31, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. We see it so differently from the way Jesus sees it. We see the cross. Jesus see glorification. We see humiliation. Jesus see glorification, exaltation. We see 
shame. Jesus see, sees redemption. He sees it really differently from the way we see. And you know, then the Lord kind of combined the whole thing for me. And I, I believe he's combining that for you as well. Because suddenly I understood that for us, there was betrayal and death. But for Christ, it was glorification, the redemption of the world. Then I understood that Jesus was God's alabaster jar. And God had just broken him. Until God broke him, the fragrance would not be released into the world. Jesus was the most precious, pure, perfect oil of God. But it was only when he was broken that the whole world smelled the fragrance of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2 says this, the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The fragrance of Christ is the most precious fragrance. He broke that for you, you know. He broke that for you. Jane, would you come back and play something softly just so that we finish with a prayer, please? Are, are we finishing? It says, he is the aroma, aroma of life leading to life. Shall we, shall we stand up before the Lord now? You know, I think it's always such an important moment. If you understood what Jesus has done for you, if you understood his love, his compassion, even... You know, if you have struggled with life and if you even have contemplated suicide like I actually tried to take my own life and Jesus very graciously came and saved me from an eternity away from him in hell and I am a trophy of his grace here speaking before you and perhaps with your eyes closed right now you might feel, you know, I really need that grace. I really need that love. I really need that perfume on me. I have smelled so bad for so long. My aroma is the aroma of death. But I want the aroma of life. I want to receive you, Jesus. Oh, and also, you know, you might be someone who knows the Lord speaking to you about your pride, about your arrogance, about you thinking that you know better than the Lord does. You don't. He has his best, your best interest at heart. Even if it's hard to begin with, he knows better than you do. That I know too. And he, Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, is coming to wash our feet. If there is anyone, you know, say yes to Jesus today. Say yes, Lord, I want to give my heart to you. I want to give my whole life to you. I don't want to follow my own ways. If that's you, would you like with everyone with their eyes closed, would you like to let me know that that's you? Would you just lift your hands? If there is anyone here, don't hesitate, you know. Don't hesitate. Just lift up your hands and say, yes, I would like, I would like Jesus in my life. I want him to lead my life. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I encourage you to do it in your heart and then confess it to someone. Say it aloud to someone. 
And you know, if, if this morning you feel that, yes, you know, I have been proud. I am a Christian. But I am one who challenges Jesus. I challenge who he is. And he's giving me a choice. He's giving the choice of following him. Or not. And that means I'm going to follow the other one. You don't want to do that. You come to the Lord in repentance. Remember, the door is low. You can only enter when you bow your head in repentance. Lord, I know this word is not the kind of word that we go uh, skipping through the beach in joy, but it's a word that does speak deeply to our hearts, Lord. It speak, speaks to my heart. And I pray that right now you encourage those, Lord, who are following that narrow way, that difficult and narrow path. Encourage every heart here that they belong to you and you exalt the humble. You humble those who exalt themselves, but you exalt the humble. And Lord, as we go through our week, that we will be thinking of John 13, of Matthew 26, of John 12. We will be thinking throughout this week that is more than just a Sunday morning. It's a walk with you. And that our feet needs to be washed every day with the word of God, with the blood of Jesus, with the precious ointment of the Father, the perfect oil of the Father. We welcome you and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.